Hello and welcome back. This is part two of what will be a three-part series about testing for inflammation, the ultimate boogeyman that frankly a lot of people have a lot of. Now remember to go back and check out that other video because I give you the framework for understanding these lab tests. If you get these lab tests done and you don't understand the concepts talked about in the first video, they're going to be limitedly useful or maybe totally useless. So go back and check it out. Remember that when we talk about inflammation, it's very nonspecific. We're trying to get more specific with each of these tests, but also acknowledge that each of these tests is only going to test for a certain flavor of inflammation. But without further ado, here are some of my favorite tests that you can run at LabCorp or Quest to determine if you have inflammation. All right, assuming you watched the other video by now, I'm going to steamroll right into these, but I also want to preface with another idea that I think is important. When we talk about inflammation, there's a severity scale and there are different diseases and different pathologies that can be resulted from inflammation. So you could say that you have inflammation if you sprain your pinky finger and you would, you would be absolutely correct if the pinky is red and swollen and tender to the touch, you would be correct saying that there is inflammation in that local tissue. You could also say that you have inflammation if you have stage four cancer, totally different varieties of soup, totally different severity level of the soup, the amount of soup the person has. So keep that in mind is that we're going to go through different patterns. We are going to talk about something that can kind of start to point you in the direction of more severe pathology and maybe getting worked up for things like cancer. But I'm going to start with more run of the mill. These are going to be useful for more people. And then we're going to get into some of the more severe patterns that you would see with things like cancer and really progressed end stage disease. Because I think that we can still learn from them and we can still understand how the body's trying to help us and protect us in each of these situations. And some of them are not limited to the severe pathology like cancer. I'll share, I actually had one of these patterns myself uh, many years ago, about 10 years ago. So I'll share that a little bit later in the video. But for starters, we're gonna talk about something called acute phase reactants or acute phase proteins. Basically, these are things that get generated in an inflammatory state, mostly because of a compound called interleukin-6, which is one of the cytokines responsible for a lot of the gnarly, nasty types of inflammation. So when there's a, an acute, like new inflammation, these things either get made or suppressed. So when we talk about the acute phase reactants, there are positively correlated acute phase reactants, meaning that as the inflammation gets higher, these things go up and up and up. There are also negative acute phase reactants, which means that they're negatively correlated with inflammation. So as the inflammation goes up and up and up and up, these things go down, 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 down. Now I will say here too, all of these should be available through LabCorp or Quest. I'm predominantly gonna be using whatever the system is that we use in the States. I know if you're overseas and you, you know, intelligently use the metric system, <laughs> you're probably going to have different ranges for these. So apologies, but this is going to be more of what I'm familiar with here in the States. Uh, you might have to convert these ranges if you're overseas, but, um, you know, hopefully that's still useful. You could do a quick Google. And the thing is that some of these are much easier to run or much cheaper to run. Some of them are going to be quite a bit more expensive and you probably wouldn't look at running all of these. If you run just a couple of them, that'll give you more of a pattern and give you an understanding of what's going on. So the first positive acute phase reaction, we're going to go with the positive ones, the things that go up first. So for the positively associated acute phase reactants, the things that will go up in inflammation, probably the most famous that you've heard about, and I mentioned it a little bit in that last video, is CRP, C-reactive protein. Now, C-reactive protein, as I mentioned in that other video, is made in the liver because of inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6. So those cytokines are made by the immune system in order to get the immune system to log on for the fight. And then C-reactive protein increases or facilitates phagocytosis. So phagocytosis, remember, is when a phagocytic cell, think of it like a Pac-Man cell, comes along and gobbles up a bit of debris or a bit of infectious stuff. So this could be a bacterial cell, it could be a virus, it could be a virally infected cell, it could be an old damaged cell, like when I had my ankle injury, for example. Anyway, these Pac-Man cells come in, 
phagocytize or engulf and swallow these compounds that need to be get, gotten rid of. And that's the entire purpose of CRP. CRP, per the current understanding in 2022, is meant to increase that phagocytosis and that Pac-Man action of the immune system. And it does a good job of it. So when we see elevated CRP, we can start thinking about the immune system being activated and maybe perceiving an infectious threat. Another one that probably a fair number of you have heard of is gonna be erythrocyte sedimentation rate or ESR. This one also is widely available. You can get it through LabCorp or Quest. They tend to run this one more when you have joint pain and they're trying to look at things like arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, for whatever reason, it, te it tends to get run more with that. Um, it is helpful. I do tend to run it on people just because I like to get a broad understanding of where somebody's at inflammatory wise, but it's not as good as CRP and it's not as good as the next one I'm gonna talk about. And really what they're looking at is they're seeing how quickly red blood cells settle out of the solution when they like shake up the blood tube. They watch it and see how long it takes them to settle to the bottom. When you're more inflamed and you have a lot more fibrinogen, which is one of these acute phase reactive, well, I'll just put it here. I'm just gonna put slash fibrinogen because really ESR is considered an indirect marker of fibrinogen, although both of them are acute phase reactant proteins. Um, but when you have more fibrinogen around, the cells clump together and then they fall out of solution much quicker and ESR goes up. So keep that in mind. It's, it's helpful. I do run it. I don't see it as useful as CRP and the next one I'm going to talk about. The next one is called Glyce A. This is kind of the new kit on the block, to be honest. I've only been running it for a couple of years. It's that new. Um, and it's spelled G-L-Y-C capital A. So Glyce A... The idea with it is it's a, uh, it's a marker that is reflective of all of the acute phase reactive proteins. I forget exactly how it works, how they do the assay, but it's, it's supposed to be reflective of all of the other acute phase reactive proteins. I will say I run both of the, I run all three of these typically, and I've seen many cases where C-reactive protein and ESR are normal, but Glyce A is elevated. Um, in my mind, uh, oh, and I forgot to tell you, so CRP, I want that as low as humanly possible. Below 0.5 would be fantastic, but the LabCorp range says that you're good as long as you're below three. Um, I think below 0.5 is where you need to be though. ESR, the lab range is like under 20, I think, but likewise, if you could get it down to like 0, 1, 2, that would be superb. Glyce A, I don't have as good of an understanding of the range because I've only been running it for a few years, but generally I want it below about 330. And I think the LabCorp reference range is a bit higher than that, like 350 or 400. So usually if I could get it down into the low, low 300s, uh, that would be really ideal. Uh, the nice thing too, is that not only is this an amalgamation of a lot of the other proteins that we're talking about, it has a much longer half-life than CRP. So you could have you could have a bad day and be really inflamed and CRP is high. And then because CRP has a pretty short half-life, 19 hour half-life, you go to LabCorp two, three days later and CRP could look pretty normal versus Glyce A is gonna stay elevated for quite a bit longer. So I think that's what's happening when I see that pattern of Glyce A being elevated and CRP being normal. I think that probably what's happening is that the inflammation level is waxing and waning from day to day, week to week, and I'm just catching it at a point where CRP is normal and Glyce A is still elevated because of that longer half-life. But I have found this to be really, really helpful. Of note, this is only available through LabCorp currently in the States. Quest does not run this. So um, I'm gonna provide a link down below for direct labs where you can get blood work done without a doctor's note, without a prescription. Uh, they don't have Glyce A yet because they contract through Quest. So just keep that in mind, but you can do any of the others if I remember correctly. The next one that not a lot of people know or appreciate is ferritin. So ferritin is of course known for iron storage. That's predominantly what it's used to test. And low ferritin is indeed a marker of iron deficiency. And it is something that I track particularly in women, but I measure it on myself as part of a yearly every single year. Um, but the other thing is that your body upregulates iron storage when you're inflamed. It's because of those, those interleukins like IL-6, and you actually store much more of your iron as ferritin. So I've seen situations where like, 
the, the CBC and the iron panel looks like iron deficiency, but the person has normal ferritin, but they also have high CRP and glyce A. So with that sort of a pattern, I'm thinking, ah, your ferritin is artificially elevated because you're inflamed. So what I was starting to say is that when I see that pattern of other inflammatory markers elevated, but ferritin is looking normal or maybe elevated, but the CBC and the iron panel looks like you're iron deficient, I'm thinking that it's the combination of inflammation and iron deficiency that's evening out the ferritin. And we're not going to use ferritin as a marker for iron deficiency in those cases. So you could use different tests to get a pattern and get an understanding of what's going on with you as an individual. Other ones, as I mentioned, fibrinogen. Now going hand in hand with ferritin, we could kind of lump these together. From here on out, the rest of these are not going to be commonly measured in blood. Um, I mean, theoretically, you could get them measured, but nobody would. Pretty much everyone's going to stick with these handful. Um, the other one that we could do is hepcidin. I'm trying to get the spelling of it. I'm totally cheating. I have it written down below my camera. Hepcidin. See, because I don't run it. Sidin. Uh, this will get more interesting in a couple minutes, but hepcidin inhibits iron absorption. And that can cause something called anemia of inflammation, AKA anemia of chronic disease. So we're gonna get into that after we get through the acute phase reactants. That is something that does pop up. It's not totally uncommon. Um, I've seen it clinically before, but hep it's because of this. Hepcidin inhibits iron absorption. And then you start to get anemia that looks like iron deficiency, but it's not quite iron deficiency and it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's because your body's so inflamed, it's inhibiting iron absorption. And I have a theory of why it might do that. The other ones that can be measured are procalcitonin. This is getting harder to write now. Procalcitonin. And last but not least, serum amyloid. Again, these are all the acute phase. Oh my God, I can't write at this angle. Yeah, that's not bad. Considering what a weird angle I was writing at, I'm kind of proud of that. Um, so again, hepcidin, procalcitonin, serum amyloid, they are acute phase reactant proteins, but nobody's going to measure these. So really just stick with here up if you want to look for this pattern. And finally, let's get into the negatively correlated acute phase reactants. You can think of these less as markers of inflammation in the traditional sense. Again, these are the guys that go up in states of inflammation. You can think of these more as um, downstream occurrences that happen with inflammation. So for example, albumin is one of the main types of protein found in your blood. When you look at a metabolic panel, you'll see protein, and then underneath that, you'll see albumin and globulin, the two main types of protein floating in your blood. Albumin in particular tends to go down when you're more inflamed. So if you look at the lab reference range from LabCorp or Quest or what have you, and you're at the bottom part of the range, like bottom 25% maybe of that range, you can maybe put two and two together. I will say also that just protein levels decrease if you're not eating enough protein. So you could also be dietary protein insufficiency. Uh, Pre-albumin is gonna be a topic I get into in a future video. I'm doing a deep dive right now. I'm making a new mini course called Malabsorption Mastery that I'm very excited about. And pre-albumin is one of the markers that might be a marker for malabsorption syndrome broadly. Um, so that's something I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on, but it appears that pre-albumin goes down in states of inflammation when those acute phase reactant proteins are elevated. Transferrin is involved with iron metabolism. So same kind of idea with the ferritin being involved, your body starts to tinker with iron regulation when you're more inflamed. There's a lot of speculation of why that would be. Um, retinol binding protein goes down. We're getting into like transferrin, maybe yes or no, but definitely from here down, I wouldn't think that you would run these on a normal battery of, of blood work. But just for what it's worth, retinol binding protein goes down, I think, probably because, and I have, I have read no research on retinol binding protein, so I'm purely speculating based on my knowledge of anatomy and physiology. But retinol, vitamin A, is very, very, very profoundly, wonderfully anti-inflammatory. 
and it helps right with the regulation and the function of the immune system. So I think retinol binding protein goes down so that more of your retinol is freely available to use in states of acute inflammation. That's my bet, at least. Again, I've read nothing on that, so don't quote me on it, but that's what I'm thinking probably is happening there. And then antithrombin, again, you can start thinking of this idea of like clotting. We're gonna talk about platelets in a little bit, like the ESR and the fibrinogen. Your, the viscosity and the clotting ability of your blood changes in states of acute inflammation. So antithrombin is another example of that. But like I said, similarly, Really, if you're looking for tests that you can get done at the doctor's office and they would be indicative of inflammation, sorry, that's kind of obnoxious, you're really looking from here up, so red dotted line up, ferritin, glyce, only available through LabCorp, ESR, and C-reactive protein. I would not run fibrinogen because you can just run ESR for way cheaper. And then you can get this done easy peasy as part of a comp metabolic panel or CMP. So that's the test that's going to look at bun, protein, AST, ALT, all of like the liver and kidney kind of function tests. You're going to find albumin as part of a CMP. That's like a five or $10 test. So that one is going to show up if you just slap a CMP on whatever blood work you're getting done. All right, believe it or not, that first part of the conversation with the acute phase reactants was the more straightforward part of the conversation, in my opinion. We're getting a little bit more in the weeds now, but hang with me because there are some more markers that can be indicative of inflammation, again, of soup. First of all, there's a couple of just miscellaneous things that I didn't get to fit in with the acute phase reactant conversation. What is homocysteine? This is moderately commonly used. I find that it's run a little bit less frequently than C-reactive protein. I like to run them together because they look at way different stuff. So again, CRP made in response to inflammation from the immune system, your immune system's kicking it into high gear to try to protect you from something presumably infectious. And then CRP helps your immune system gobble up stuff more efficiently. Homocysteine is completely different. This is more of a metabolic inflammation marker and it's very specific to two things. B vitamin intake or adequacy or inadequacy and protein intake. I have seen homocysteine elevated because people are blatantly deficient in B vitamins, most notably folate and B12. But I've also seen homocysteine that is persistently high in people who are taking good versions of B vitamins and they're getting enough intake, not because the person has malabsorption, which is the thing everyone would jump to, but because they're eating too much animal protein. Animal protein is very high in methionine and methionine gets turned into homocysteine. So if you're taking in too much methionine rich animal protein, like muscle tissue, you run the risk of having high homocysteine. And to that note, I'm actually very curious. I wonder if people on the carnivore diet would be more prone to having high homocysteine, just knowing how the metabolism works. I'm not saying it's, it's for sure a thing, but I kind of wonder if that's a thing. Anyway, we'll see research on it someday. So homocysteine, think B vitamins and questionable if you're consuming too much animal protein and too much methionine. Number two, that again, fit into the miscellaneous category here is uric acid. Uric acid is most famous for gout, gouty arthritis. However, not well known or not, um, not commonly known, uric acid is the most abundant antioxidant floating around in your bloodstream. It's an antioxidant, guys. So I could see this one being indicative of inflammation in two different ways. If uric acid is high, then I would assume that your body is trying to pump out more of this antioxidant to deal with inflammation, to try to quench the inflammation. And that does very much seem to be the case in cases of gout. There's a lot of research on something called the NLP3 inflammasome and gout and the uric acid being involved in that. So I think that that is actually pretty well proven right now. I also speculate though, because it's an antioxidant and the antioxidant is gonna quench inflammation, I wonder if low uric acid could be a bad thing too, because it's like you have so much inflammation that your body has burned through all the uric acid. I don't know if there's as much research to support that. Definitely high uric acid being linked with inflammation is a very well-established thing in the literature. I don't know about the low comment, but 
And again, just trying to give you guys the most clear, well-rounded picture, complete picture that I can. Um, the other thing is that tissue specific markers can be indicative of inflammation. Because again, inflammation is not always your entire body. It can be very tissue specific. So for example, if you have elevated LFTs, liver function tests like AST and ALT, that is happening because there's tissue damage and inflammation in the liver. So elevated AST and ALT, liver function test, that is a inflammatory marker. It's not an inflammatory marker in the sense of like your whole body is inflamed, like we traditionally think of when we're talking about testing for inflammation, but it is an inflammation marker. Similarly, knowing some of the physiology of what will cause inflammation in the body, if you are insulin resistant and you have high glucose, high A1C, high insulin levels, we know that that's gonna cause inflammation. We don't need to look for the inflammation, just seeing the insulin resistance proves that you have inflammation to begin with. So it's stuff like that. You can kind of read between the lines at some point with this. Anemia, you would be hard pressed to not be somewhat inflamed if you had anemia because you're not getting oxygen to the tissues. That is in and of itself inflammatory. So there's a lot of like tissue specific markers or disease specific markers that can be indicative of this. Similarly to autoimmune antibodies. If you have elevated antibodies against self tissue, like your thyroid or your joints, you know that there's at least inflammation in that target tissue, whether or not it's systemic broad inflammation or if it's localized to that one tissue might not matter a whole lot. You know you have inflammation in at least one tissue. Now, moving on to, so the, the, all of the prior conversation was more framing as like, what most of you will deal with and what most of you think of when you think of testing for inflammation. The next two things I'm gonna talk about briefly have more to do with really serious pathology. So things like cancer that could potentially be life-threatening or particularly scary. So for, oh, and really quickly though, sorry, um, little bit of ADHD scroll brain, um, homocysteine, the LabCorp reference range says that you're good as long as it's below 15. I think that's way too high. You probably want it somewhere between like six-ish and nine-ish in an ideal world. So don't listen to the LabCorp ranges, especially on that one. Um, but over here, I've written down a couple of things for anemia of inflammation, also known as anemia of chronic disease. So when you look at the research on this, it's a fascinating world to get into. Really, it's researched predominantly in cancer patients. And I think it's the body being really, really smart because your body knows, say if you had stage four cancer and you were fighting for your life, you would not want to foolishly expend your energy running a marathon. Like you wanna focus your energy and focus your attention on healing the body. So the theory is, and I do believe this is true, the theory right now is that anemia of chronic disease happens because your body is intentionally trying to make you tired and it's trying to throttle down your ability to do too much activity because it knows it needs to focus on bigger stuff. So that being said, uh, because it's anemia, that would be characterized by low red blood cells, hematocrit and hemoglobin. That's like the standard textbook definition of anemia. This one also would have low MCV, MCH, MCHC. So those are the things that come next in the CBC. These two things together, look very much like iron deficiency, right? Like microcytic, hypochromic, anemia, this is the classic for iron deficiency, but then the plot thickens. Serum iron usually is also a bit on the lower end, okay? It's still tracking well with iron deficiency, right? Not necessarily, because iron saturation, TIBC, total iron binding capacity, which would be seen on an iron panel, and ferritin tend to be, um, well, they tend to be normal. I'm trying to think of how I wanted to pick this on this chart. I'm just gonna, I'll do this. Within normal limits, WNL. So iron saturation, TIBC, and ferritin tend to be normal or very close to the normal range. The big one that I tend to look at more so with this is TIBC. Um, that total iron binding capacity goes up if you're iron deficient and it'll be low or normal if you're not iron deficient. And this is the one I mentioned in the beginning of the video. I had this. I have never had cancer. I'm not a cancer survivor, but I had this pattern. And it was when my IBS was really bad. 
And I remember learning about it in a functional medicine seminar. And I thought, oh my God, this is wild stuff. Like I know that most of the research is on really aggressive pathology. And um, come, come to find out later, it resolved after I worked on my microbiome and of note at the time when my IBS was bad, in addition to having all the symptoms of SIBO, and I really think it was SIBO, I also had not one, but two parasites. And I think it might've been the parasitic infection that was doing this to my iron panel and my CBC, but I had anemia of inflammation, anemia of chronic disease. I don't know for how long, I just happened to catch it on some blood work and it did resolve all on its own when I treated the parasitic infections. So for what it's worth, I actually had had this one. So it's not exclusively limited to people with cancer. So you never know if you'll, if you'll see this one. But the point is too, is that you would never know that, that that is what it is unless you ran an iron panel with TIBC. I think ferritin is optional in this case, because honestly, the ferritin might not tell you a whole lot. Um, but you would need that iron panel with TIBC and iron saturation to tell you that that's what you're dealing with. So make sure that you're getting complete blood work. Um, there's a, there's a fine line between testing all the things I mentioned today and losing all of your blood, um, and having like 15 tubes taken out of your body versus not having enough information. But certainly, um, I think an iron panel is worthy of that little additional bit of blood being taken. Um, there's a wasp on the window. It's on the outside. Okay. I can continue. I didn't know if that was inside the window, in which case I would have bolted out of the room. Uh, anyhow, last thing for this video, I swear. And then in the next video, we're going to get into the functional medicine tests for inflammation, because believe it or not, there are more laughable side note. I thought that this was going to be one video. And then I started making my bullet point notes and formatting it and deciding how I wanted to structure it. And I realized, no, man, this would be a beast of video. So anyway, this was going to be one video and it turned out to be three laughably. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover briefly is what's called the ominous pattern. So the ominous pattern is ominous. It would tip you off that something very, very serious is going on and that you need to seek appropriate medical, uh, uh medical evaluation. The one that this is really talked about more so with is cancer. So again, if, if you were to see this on yourself or on a patient and they had other sides of symptoms that might point to something really aggressive or something really scary like cancer, by all means, get them to the appropriate referral. But for what it's worth, with the ominous pattern, um, low cholesterol, like low, 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 like I'm talking below 140, again, using American reference ranges here, below 140, but the key here is that it has a sudden drop. If you had cholesterol that was stable for years and years and years, and then out of the blue, all of a sudden on your next round of lab work, it dropped like a rock. That's part of the ominous pattern. So it's not just low cholesterol because honestly, I have had low cholesterol for a long time. And that's, that's a whole nother topic for another day. That's actually a little bit concerning to me because uh, you can't have too little of cholesterol, but it's a sudden big drop in your cholesterol that is not typical for your normal. That is the big thing for the ominous pattern. Throwback to albumin, which we talked about with the acute phase reactant thing. Because remember, albumin is going to be suppressed in stages of acute inflammation when those acute phase reactants are really going hog wild. Albumin, and again, I'm, I'm using this for like American units. So forgive me for people abroad, you have to convert to whatever units you use. But um, albumin below 4.0 is part of this ominous pattern. Similarly, they give you the AG ratio. That's the ratio between albumin and globulin on the blood work. If the ratio of AG is below 1.0, that is a piece of this ominous pattern. And I should say it's called the ominous pattern. No single one of these is going to be indicative of cancer or inflammation all on its own. But if you have more and more of them, you start to see the pattern. And the criteria that I have been taught for this is that it needs to be three or more of these criteria to fit the ominous pattern. So if you have like one or two of them, don't freak out. I should have said that in the beginning. It's not like that. So albumin below 4.0, AG ratio below 1.0. 
lymphs, you can think of it, um, there's two ways that you'll see lymphocytes and white blood cells on a CBC with diff. Um, it's going to be either below 20% or below 1,500. That is pretty bad handwriting. That's, that's all right. You'll have to deal. So below 20% or below 1,500 for the absolute count for lymphocytes. That's pretty low. Usually lymphocytes are around 30, 35% of your white count. So that would be pretty notably low. And then platelets, funny enough, platelets can be part of this ominous pattern if they're too high or if they're too low. So for the low end, if platelets are below 150, which is below the LabCorp and Quest reference range, and if they are above 450, that also is part of this pattern. So I think 450 is the top end of the LabCorp reference range. So if you're sitting here thinking, gosh, I know I'm inflamed, oh my gosh, if you've got some of this stuff going on and you have this pattern of like low lymphocytes, platelets either super low or super high, albumin's low, your cholesterol tanked all of a sudden out of the blue. This is the sort of stuff where I would honestly really want to refer you to some sort of a cancer screening, whether you do like thermography or MRI, or you go to your primary care, or you get referred to an oncologist. But if you have three or more of these, that is indicative of really severe inflammation, most notably cancer. So I felt like it was my duty to at least share this with you, but acknowledging if you're here watching my channel, chances are you're not here to learn about cancer. Chances are you're thinking more about like um, the non-cancer types of inflammation that we encounter much more frequently on a day-to-day -day basis. So a lot, most of you won't have to worry about this, but I felt like it was worthy of talking about in the context of testing for inflammation. And that's all there is to it. That's all you need to do to test for inflammation. Who knew it was that easy, right? You just need 50 some odd markers. I don't know. I, you know, I'm sorry, but also I'm not sorry. You guys know my deal by this point. This is video number 250 something on this channel alone. And then we have a hundred episodes on the IBS Freedom Podcast. You guys know my deal. I would rather be thorough and honest and give you a complete view of whatever we're talking about rather than just dumbing it down and saying, eh, just run C-reactive protein and you're, you're good to go. That's the end all be all of inflammation testing. It's just not true. There are different types of inflammation and locations and patterns. And I hope that this was helpful. Let me know in the comments down below if you have had any of these tests done. If anybody else has had in anemia of chronic inflammation, I like, I can't believe I had that, but I did. Um, I'm curious if any of you guys have had some of these patterns before or any of these markers abnormal before. And I'm curious if any of you have experienced that oh so common tale that I mentioned at the beginning of the video where the doctor says, eh, you're fine, you don't have inflammation, yet you feel inflamed and you know that you have inflammation. I've heard that from nearly all of my patients or all of my students at some point or another. So I'm curious if you guys have experienced that too. Speaking of students though, for those of you who don't know, today should be Friday, August 19th, 2022. And FODMAP Freedom, my group coaching program is opening for the last time in 2022 on Monday, August 22nd. But here's the key. It's only opening up to the folks who are on the wait list this week. Those guys get early enrollment dibs and a super special bonus gift when they enroll. So if you're waiting around for me to publicly announce it on YouTube or Instagram or email, you're going to be waiting around and it might be too late because we almost had to cap the enrollment in the spring. I want to keep it a smaller intimate group so that I can help each of you individually. I don't want this to be like some massive things with hundreds of students. And I feel like I'm not able to help each of you individually. So if you're on the fence about FODMAP Freedom, join the wait list like now, right now, I'm going to put it in the description and the first comment. Getting on the wait list is non-committal. You don't have to join. All it means is that you're going to be the first to know when it's open. You're going to get that email and you're going to get to sign up before everybody else does when I post the link publicly on Instagram and YouTube. And that's really critical because again, we're going to have to close the enrollment at some point, I think in the second week. So you want to get those emails first. If you are watching this video the week of the 22nd and you're like, ah, oh, crap, it's Wednesday, it's Thursday. I can't believe I missed this. Don't sweat it. Just click the link anyway and join the wait list anyhow, because I'm going to be sending out multiple emails that week to the people on the wait list. So you can, maybe you missed the first email on Monday, 
but as long as we're still enrolling, you can still join it when I send out the next link. So you should be okay, don't panic. You can email me if need be too, but I think you should be able to join the waitlist that week. And if you're watching this video, you know, sometime else in the future, September onward, just join the waitlist and then you can join us when we re-enroll. I think we're gonna do January of 2023 is the next session. So just go ahead and hunker on there and we can get you in for that January session. But thank you guys so much for watching this video. This was a really long, really thorough one. So I'm glad that you're still here. Thank you so much for tuning in. And in the next video, we're gonna be talking about functional medicine tests for inflammation, because believe it or not, there's more that we could talk about when it comes to testing inflammation. And I can't wait to nerd out with you then. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.